Good morning, everyone. We're going to do something just a little bit different this morning. I'm going to welcome everyone here in the house. Um, glad that you're in attendance with us. For all of those that are visiting with us on the, uh, watching us on the television and listening to us on the radio, we're glad that you're, you're joining us as well. If you would like to join us in person here and don't have a ride, please call the church office at uh, 359-4077. We'll make arrangements to get you to the church and back home again. Now. If you would, I'd like everyone to join hands on each pew out here and join me in going to the Lord in prayer, please. If you would, just stretch across the aisleway here. Join hands. All right. Dear Lord, in Matthew 18, 20, you tell us, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. We forget that sometimes. We try to do things ourselves without first kneeling before you in prayer. We forget that when we are in your house, we're not here to be seen or entertained, Heavenly Father. We're here to give you praise and to worship you. We are here to offer intercessory prayer for those in need of your healing hand, to ask forgiveness for our sins, to seek guidance for our pathways and your light unto our feet. We forget all these things are possible through you. Today it is my prayer that we remember these things, that we show our love not only for you, but for those of, around us as we love ourselves. Please forgive us, Heavenly Father, where we fall short of your glory and your grace. Help us to walk through life with your strength, with your outreached arms and your loving spirit. For these many things I ask in the Lord's, our Savior's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now if you would... Welcome each other. I may have done the wrong thing already, but I want to talk to y'all about God's love this morning. Did you ever wonder just how much God loves you? Did you ever wonder? Well, I thought this morning we might try and measure it, okay? 
So I brought some different stuff. We're going to try and figure out which one of them we're going to use, okay? So, Reed, what have you got? A measuring cup, right? Oh, come on. You've been in the kitchen before and seen Mama make cookies or something. No? Okay. Well, that's a measuring cup. See, you know what that is. That's a measuring cup. If we were going to make cookies, we'd measure our flour and our sugar and all that stuff. Well, let's see. You think we could measure God's love with a measuring cup? You think so? Well, I found this passage in Psalms 23 that says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Y'all know that part, right? But then down here below it says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Mm. So if our cups run over, I guess we can't measure God's love with that. Okay? So that's out. Okay. Well, Matthew, what have you got? It's a measuring thing, isn't it? Yeah. It's fun, isn't it? Yeah, it's a measuring tape. It's, it's apparently the source of a lot of fun. Uh, do you think we can measure God's love with that? No. You think we might? You don't think we can? Hmm? What do you think? You think we can measure God's love with that measuring tape? I think that's what, maybe a 9 or 12 foot measuring tape. Well, I did find something in the Bible about that too. Y'all didn't know there were measuring tapes in the Bible, did you? Well, let's see. In Psalm 108, it says, For great is your love, higher than the heavens, your faithfulness reaches to the skies. That's not going to reach to the sky, is it? No. So I guess we can't use, we can't use a measuring tape to measure God's love this morning, can we? I guess the watch is going to measure. You think the watch? What have you got, Annie? What have you got? You have my very favorite Mickey Mouse watch. Now, what do we measure with a watch? I like Mickey Mouse, too. That's why I have a watch with him on it. You measure the time. You measure the time. So, can we measure God's love in time? Do you think? Well, let's see. I bet the Bible's got something about that, too. Psalms 103. You live and learn, folks. You live and learn, I'm telling you. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Y'all have just got me all discombobulated. Do y'all know what that means? Okay. Psalms 108, verse 4. That's not the one I want. See, y'all have got me so messed up this morning. Okay, in, we're talking about time, right? Okay, in Psalms 103, verse 17, it says, From everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear Him. Everlasting to everlasting. Now, Mickey Mouse can do a lot with that watch, but he can't measure that, can he? No, he can't. So none of these things can help us to measure God's love. But let me read you a couple of verses here in Ephesians that I think will... We'll solve all that. Could you please take the bag and collect all of our measurement instruments? Yeah, yeah, we got to let it go now. We got to let it go now, Matthew. Oh, no, that's not Matthew. He reminds me of Matthew. Though. Somehow. Thank you so much. Now, in Ephesians verse, or chapter 3, it says, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Now, if you hadn't learned anything else today except how to play with a tape measure, I hope you have learned how much God loves you and that it is simply not something you can measure except to know it in your heart. Okay, let's say our prayers now. Let's say our prayers, okay? Can we say a prayer? Okay, let's, make, let's, let's say our prayers, okay? Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, I praise you for these little children, and I hope, Lord, that, that they know how much you love them, Lord, and that they know that it can't be measured, Lord. And I just ask you to watch over them and keep them safe, Lord. Amen. you would all please stand for the reading of scripture. 
It is Psalms chapter 50, which is page 479 in your pew Bible. The mighty one, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its, to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes. He does not keep silent. Before him is a devouring fire. Around him a mighty tempest. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he, that he may judge his people. Gather to me, my faithful ones, who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. I will not accept a bull from your house or goats from your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills and all the moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. But to the wicked God says, What, what right have you to recite my statues or take my covenant on your lips? For you hate discipline and you cast my words behind you. If you see a thief, you are pleased with him, and you keep company with adulterers. You give your mouth free rein for evil, and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I have been silent. You thought that I was one like yourself, but now I rebuke you, and I lay the charge before you. Mark this. Then you who forget God, lest I tear you apart, and there be none to deliver. The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. To one who orders his way rightly, I will show the salvation of God. May God bless the reading and hearing of his word.
Heavenly Father, it's that time that, that you allow us to give back just a small portion of what you so richly bless us with each and every day. We ask, Heavenly Father, that these tithes and these offerings, dear Lord, bring grace and glory to your kingdom. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I want to move from this world of fear, kind of getting tired of living here. Want to go home where the winds of sorrow never blow. Far from the shadow of the tomb, far from the sadness and the gloom. I want to go home when death demands my tattered soul. Getting ready today, getting ready today, moving out tomorrow. Gonna say goodbye to earthly sorrow. I'm looking for a mansion fair. I see the lights. I see the lights. I'm almost there. I want to go home when life is through. Moving out to heaven where dreams come true. I can get thrilled just thinking about the glory we will share. See loved ones who are gone. Gonna see the king upon his throne. And never return to this old life when I get there. Getting ready today. Getting ready today. Moving out tomorrow. Gonna say goodbye. Gonna say goodbye to earthly sorrow. I'm looking for. I'm looking for a mansion there. I see the light. I see the light. I'm almost there. Getting ready today, Get ready today. moving out tomorrow. Gonna to say goodbye. Gonna say goodbye to earthly sorrow. I'm looking for I'm looking for a mansion back. I see the light. I see the lights. I'm almost there. I see the light. I'm almost there. I'm almost there. I'm almost there. Okay, this, this is a contest between me and Charles. I want the mics up and he wants them down. Okay. <laughs> You'll see why in just a moment here. Just a moment. All right, well, good morning to you all. Have you, uh, have you worshipped well this morning? Had a, had a good time together in the Lord and uh, we've come together in this place. This is, this is an auspicious Sunday in, in case you... For those of you who have been reading... We are finishing the Old Testament. Amen. And the people said... <laughs> now, now, I know there are a couple of chapters left to read from the book of Nehemiah, but we're going to transition into the New Testament. And, and what, what I really would like to talk about today is how, how God's story goes on. That it, 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 it's not a, that was then, this is now. And, and make a clear division between the Old Testament and the New Testament in our minds and hearts. I'd like for us to see how it continues. The story that God began uh, carrying out in the Old Testament is, uh, is continuing in the New Testament. So the first three words in the Bible introduce God's story to us. Breshit bara Elohim are the first three words that appear in the Hebrew Bible. They mean... In the beginning, God created. God spoke, and something came out of nothing. And in the order of his choosing, God created humankind, mankind, Adam and Eve. Now, and after creating all that is and calling it very good, the Lord's very good creation suffered a devastating fall. 
So Adam and Eve were a part of that event. And so let's just take a moment and let's let Adam and Eve tell their story. say the word a thousand times, but it doesn't define it. Uh, what did Adam do to make Eve like him? How old are you? That's like something my grandpa would say. <laughs> well, did he have lines? I'd like to hear what he has to say. All right, um, and it was like, uh, hey, Eve, did it hurt when you fell from heaven? Well, technically, Eve didn't fall from heaven. She was formed from her rib. Yeah, I know the story, but it would be a terrible pickup line if he was like, Hey, Eve, did it hurt when God formed you from my rib? That's like a Ryan Davis line or something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but... Hey, you know what? Actually, this is a good opportunity. Uh, you just stay there, and uh, you be Adam, and I will be Eve. <laughs> hey, Adam. First of all, I don't think Eve had a southern accent. Well, do you know where the garden was? No. Exactly. And besides, all pretty girls come from the South. <laughs> Minus one. What? So you really want to go down this road? Yes, I'm Eve. So, um, hey, Adam. Hey, Eve. What are you doing? Well, I was over there, and then you called me over here, so here I am. <laughs> Funny story. Uh, when you were over there, way, way on the other side of the garden, you were kind of pretty, but here, up close, <laughs> breathtaking, right? I'm just, that's one way to put it. Yeah. Uh, so why'd you call me over here? I don't want to tell you. Anything. Oh no, come on, just no, tell me. No. Oh come on, just do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Where did that come from? <laughs> oh. Uh, okay. So, um, Eve, is your daddy a thief? No. Well, he must be because he took the stars. And he put them in your eyes. Okay, well that's wrong for several reasons. Number one, God is my daddy. Um, and then uh, B. One and B. Well, there's no pneumo alphameric system yet, so I can say wherever I want. Um, and then B, um, he made my star, the stars and my eyes, so he'd have to thief nothing. And then choo-choo train. One B choo-choo train? It's going to catch on. Don't you worry about it. And then choo-choo train, you're a silly man. <laughs> You're the silliest man in the whole wide world. Eve, I'm the only man in the whole wide world. And the silliest. <laughs> okay, so what were you doing before I called you over here? I was over there naming some fish. Eve, with all due respect, when we were walking with God, he told me that it was my job to name the stuff. Yeah, but you're going to see something throughout all of history. When the man doesn't do it, the woman steps in and does it. That's all I'm saying. I'm just <laughs> No, no, that's not fair, because I was busy naming other stuff. Listen, I'll give you the credit in the book. Don't worry about it. It's fine. <laughs> All right, so what'd you name the fish? Um, well, there was this one, and he had whiskers like a cat, so I named him a catfish. Okay. And then there was this one that was like a pinky color, and I was like, you're either going to be salmon or salmon, but I can't decide. And then the last one I named a guppy. Why do you call it a guppy? Well, I scooped him up in my hands, and I was like, what's your name going to be, little fella? And he just looked at me and went, goop, 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 goop. <laughs> and I was like, you're a guppy. And I threw him back in the water, and he swam off on his back. <laughs> Cute little fella. That's, that's nice to know, but I really have to go now. Oh, no, no, come on. You called me over here. No, Eve, I really Oh, no, come on. Just know, tell me. Really just tell me. No, tell me. Tell me. Tell me. Tell me! I really must invent chocolate to fix that. I'm just... <laughs> okay, Eve. Here. Uh, where'd that come from? What are you talking about? You were just like, whoop, there's a note. <laughs> just, just take the note. What's this substance you made it out of? I made it out of a tree. I call it paper. I'd have gone with papyrus. <laughs> I, wrote, I wrote it with something I call a pencil that I made from lead. Was it a number two pencil? I am so sorry. We are not method acting here. Just read the note. Okay. Dearest Eve, 
Do you like me? Check box, yes or no. <laughs> oh yes, Adam, I do like you. You're the most handsome man in the whole wide world. In fact, I've been saving something for a special occasion. <sighs> Don't it look delicious? Come on, it's a tiny apple. Well, actually, it's unidentified fruit from the Old Testament. I was going to name it a Macintosh. <laughs> that, that's nice. Uh, just tell me which tree you got it from. Oh, one of them trees over there. Whitney, I have to know which one. God told us not to eat from specific trees. The Smarty Tree. The Tree of Knowledge? Yeah, that one. With all due respect, that's the tree that God told us not to eat from. We aren't even supposed to touch it. But I'm all confused now. How? It was well, very plain and simple. I was over there, and uh, this little fella came up to me. Little fella? I'm the only guy here. That's weird, ain't it? Okay, well, I was over there, and this little fella popped up, and he's like, don't that look delicious? Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> what was that? Don't that look delicious? Blah, 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 blah. So he had tongue problems. Yeah, like a speech impediment. And I was like, well, God said we're really not supposed to touch it or look at it. And he's like, did God really say that? Blah, 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 blah. And so now I'm all confused. I, I really don't think we No, should. listen, just because you think that no, you know everything that's going to happen. Listen, us you don't I'm, know. I'm just, you think you know everything. Everybody's telling me, listen to the man. Y'all listen to the man. Well, the man's dragging me down. I'm going to be my own woman. I'm going to go blog about it. Eve, Eve. Don't touch me. It's probably not that big of a deal. Oh, I knew you were going to say that, huh? All right, ladies first. That's where that came from, by the way. Mmm, it's pretty good. What? Just take a bite. What's, what's the problem? No, just, just take a bite, it's fine. Okay. It's going to change your life. Okay, it's good, it's juicy, it's better than most other tiny apples. You're, 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 you're naked! I did not prepare for this, I dressed appropriately. Oh. Okay, I'm a man, I can fix this. Well then fix it, man! All right, okay, 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 uh, get some fig leaves. Fig leaves, you got it. Eve, I need one. Why on earth would you? You need one. All right. Yes, you do. All right. You need two. I am not that fat, Adam. <laughs> You're right. I need two. All right. Okay. This was an awkward day. Tell me about it. But I mean, what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> yeah. What's the worst that could happen? It's not like we changed history or anything. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? And then God showed up. Oh, snap. Well, God, I was over there and I didn't even she know what was going on. I was just talking to him and he was like, it's my fault, but I told him the little fella said something to me and I didn't know that it was going on. Little fella. I'm it's sorry. your fault. It's his fault, Lord. He said it was okay. He didn't say anything like that. All right. I, I, I know we messed up, but we're kind of like the first kids, so if you could just give us another chance, we have to leave? Come on, Lord. Give us another chance, Lord. Come on. Come on, Lord. There's going to be more consequences? Come on, Lord. Come on, Lord. I'm going to have to work? It's about time, Lord. Come on. All right, Lord. Come on, Lord. What does she have to do? Come on, Lord. Come on, Lord. Tell him about it. Come on. What? It's going to hurt when I have babies. I'd rather work, Lord. Come on. Come on, Lord. I'd rather work. Well, Eve, I guess we have to go find an apartment somewhere. Come on. <laughs> In that slightly humorous telling of uh, what happened in the Garden of Eden, you may not have picked up on the fact that, that the, what took place was devastating, absolutely devastating. After creating everything that is that God called very good, God's very good creation has suffered a devastating fall. And it came from a willful disobedience on the part of Adam and Eve. 
our first parents have brought this, this thing to pass. Now, the story that, uh, uh, that God began telling by creating everything that is now has two tracks, and those two tracks are, one, what God is doing, and the other track is how man is sinning. And these two parallel and intertwine with each other, and this part of the story, this is what we're, we've been reading together in the Old Testament. The effects of the fall imprint every circumstance, every event, every experience in every life. In fact, the whole of God's good creation is affected in a devastating way by what took place in the garden. And it has passed from generation to generation, from person to person, to this very moment. And if you read the whole Bible together, you'll get the idea that as time passes, as we get closer to what we call the end, it gets worse, this, this problem with, with the fall. So the rest of God's story is marked by both what God is doing and how man is sinning. And so you discover that early on, there's a covenant. God makes a covenant with a man named Abraham, and he says, through you, all the nations are going to be blessed, which gives us a clue that, that God had in mind from the very beginning not to just focus on some select few people that he called his chosen people, but his intention was to bless all the nations. In fact, that, that very theme will be carried over in the, in the New Testament when Jesus himself announces that, that we are to make disciples of all the nations. It's the same language that's being described there that, uh, that talks about God's ultimate purpose. There's a covenant, and then later on there's an exodus. The people of, of uh, God have found themselves in slavery in Egypt and God hears their cries for deliverance and he comes down to set them free. Uses a man named Moses, leads them to a promised land and takes them to another place where they enter into a covenant with God's people. And then there's a conquest of the land. After wandering in the wilderness for a generation because of the fact of their sin, they take possession of a land that God gave them, that God promised to give them. And after taking possession of that land and living in that land for a little while, they establish a kingdom. And uh, then there's a civil war in the kingdom. And, and it's, it's bad. I mean, they just didn't make it as a, as a kingdom, as a nation very long before they were fighting with each other. And, and so there's a civil war and the kingdom splits. There's a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. The kingdom of Israel in the north and the kingdom of Judah in the south. And they just refuse to get along even though some of the prophets come along and said, said, there ought to be a way for us to get back together, they just refused to do it. So the civil war resulted in a divided kingdom. And when you read about those kings and those various kingdoms, you'll discover that in the north, not a single one of the kings did right in the eyes of the Lord. And so the Lord brought judgment on the northern kingdom. About 120 years before he brought judgment on the southern kingdom. When you look at the kings of the southern kingdom the, of Judah, you'll discover that three or four, maybe five, out of the, the dozen or so kings that, that reigned, only that handful did what was right in the eyes of the Lord because the people tended to sin more and more and more as time passed. God brought judgment on them, so there came an exile. There came the time when God's people were transported from where they lived. They lost everything that they owned. They lost their whole way of life, and they were taken to uh, Babylon, uh, Babylonia. And uh, there they lived for about 70 years, 70 years in exile with, without any real strong sense of identity. But after 70 years in exile, the Persians came along, and they released they released these guys to go uh, back to their, their promised land, the land that God gave them. And, and the Lord was with them. The Lord was with them in the, in the leadership of a guy named Zerubbabel. We've read about him not too many uh, weeks ago, too, uh, too long ago. Uh, uh, another fellow named Ezra who was a scribe and who had committed to teach the law of the Lord to God's people and to put it into practice in his own life and... Uh, and he was a student of scripture, and so he came and was a powerful leader in the lives of the people. And a guy named Nehemiah, who felt the passion to 
caught a vision about rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem and restoring the city. And, and all of that would come together to give the, the people an opportunity to restore their own life. The preaching of Haggai and Zechariah and Malachi enabled the people to rebuild their lives and renew their faith. And so life had promise and hope again. It was like a, a new exodus. It was like a new creation. It was, like, it was like God was starting over, wiping the slate clean and starting all over again. But if you've read the story, and how many of you have read this far? Many of you have. Most of you have. And, and that's, a, that's a good thing. You just know that human sin marches merrily along. It just keeps on going. It just keeps on happening. And, and despite all the opportunity that the people of God have, they, they just don't quite get it. And the Lord keeps working with them. Despite their rebellion and their rejection, despite what they're doing to put him off, the Lord keeps working with them, working his purpose and his plan to redeem and to renew all of creation. You see, when that fall occurred, this, this imprint that is upon all the world in which we live, it's, it's on our souls and it's in, in the life in, that we live in the world in which we inhabit here, that, that devastating something has, has sort of, it's the reason that God is in the business of trying to redeem and renew. It affected all of creation. The whole creation is groaning, is what Romans 8 says. And waiting, as if in pains of childbirth, for the renewal of the sons of God. Redemption that's going to occur is not going to just affect you and me individually. It's going to affect the whole of creation. It's a grand sweep of what God is doing. It's as if that originally intended very good creation is going to come to be again at the very end. It's going to take the whole story of God. The point I want to make here is that, that when the people have continued to sin and they have this new opportunity and they're, they're in the place where where, where God is giving them yet another chance, Malachi 2, 17 through 3, 1 tells us the Lord speaking, you have wearied the Lord with your words. But you say, how have we wearied him? By saying, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or by asking, where is the God of justice? Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. And, and if you continued reading in, in Malachi, and you, and you just sort of skipped over to Malachi chapter 4 and find your way to verse 4, you'll see a sort of a, 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 an echo of what has already been said. Echo uh, Malachi 4.4 4, 4, 4 says, Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So what God is saying is that, okay, you're, you're messed up. The world is messed up. The whole universe is messed up. And try as you will, you're not going to be able to get it straight. In order to straighten things out, I'm sending a messenger ahead who will prepare the way for the Lord. And so these promises are very, very important. Not only is Malachi the last of the speaking and writing prophets to convey a word of the Lord, there's going to be a period of 400 years that there is no fresh word from the Lord. In anticipation for the fulfillment of this promise, God says there's going to be my messenger on the scene and he will prepare the way of the Lord to come and he will begin to set things right. Well, guess what? God's story continues and reaches a climax in the person and work of Jesus. And if you've read through the Old Testament so far and you haven't quite gotten the storyline and the, the narrative that tells the story, then, then I've done that for you this morning. I've tried to share you, with you what that story is. But I want you to see that, that the Old Testament was not then and now the New Testament is, is what we have. 
I'd like you to see that the Old Testament moves forward and brings God's story forward into the present moment. And it incorporates and culminates and continues in the person and work of Jesus. So we're not really starting something new. We're just, pick, we're just at a kind of a, a, a new beginning point for those of us. If you have fallen behind on your reading of the Old Testament, you can catch up with the rest of us because next week we're going to start looking more clearly at the, at the New Testament. And, and the first thing I want you to see as we anticipate the unfolding of the story here is that God's story continues and reaches this climax in the person and work of Jesus. Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, introduce the gospel of Jesus Christ. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in, the, in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes one who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He's the promise. He's the one that God promised in Malachi. He's the one who comes on the scene and his ministry is to prepare the way for the Lord. Some other passages of scripture in the Old Testament tell us that he's going to take the, take the mountains and level them off. He's going to fill in the valleys and he's going to make a straight path for the Lord. He's going to make a highway for the people of God, not only to return to their land, but a highway for them to return to their God. And that's the picture of what John the Baptist is doing. He's come on the scene to prepare the way for the Lord. And it wouldn't be fair if we didn't just continue the reading of, of uh, Mark uh, chapter 1, beginning at ver continuing at verse 9. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water immediately, he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. What God promised through the prophet Malachi has now come to fruition in the person and the work of Jesus. This is an amazing thing. We, have, we don't have a, a birth account in Mark's gospel. Mark's was probably the first gospel written. The, he's the first one that sat down to tell the story of Jesus in the way that he did. He was a kind of pattern for the other gospel uh, writers to, uh, uh, to write. And, and so he sets the pattern. He doesn't begin with the birth of Jesus. He just throws Jesus right into the action. He just puts him on the scene. We pick up Jesus as an adult young man, and he's on the scene, and the first thing he's going to do is call his disciples, and he's going to begin doing what Jesus only can do. He's going to move toward the cross. And read the book of Mark, you'll discover it is a defense of the fact of the cross. The whole, the whole business of the gospel of Mark is to tell us that Jesus died on a cross and was raised again. That's, that's the person and the work. Who he is and what he did is what makes salvation possible for us. If you think that you can earn salvation apart from what Jesus did and who he is, then you will fail. It, it is just not offered to you that by your obedience, by your good works, by your good intention, by anything apart from the person and work of Jesus, will you be saved. And the gospel wants to make clear for us that that's God's way of solving the problem. Because you cannot fix the sin problem from the outside. You have to have God working on the inside to fix the sin problem. You need the forgiveness of God even to begin this process. This life depends completely and entirely upon the forgiveness of God and his bestowing upon you his spirit of his making you a child beloved as much as Jesus, his unique son, was beloved. 
That's the wonder of the gospel. And if you think, if you think you are getting there on your own, you are sadly mistaken. I want you to understand that. I, I, I'm, I, I, I'm just burdened by the fear that there may be some who are a part of this fellowship who believe that it is your effort that will win you your birth in heaven. It is not your effort. It is the person and the work of Jesus that will bring you to heaven. And your faith in him is how you get there. Now, let's tie together the Testaments. Let's, let's put together how the Old and New Testament sort of dovetail. And we can do that by turning to Luke chapter 24. Uh, and this is, really, this is really a good portion of scripture for us. See, Luke chapter 24 uh, find your way to verse 25. There were some troubled disciples. They're walking along the road that uh, leads to a, a little town called Emmaus. Not very far from Jerusalem, but it's long enough for them to walk and talk. And they, What has happened is that, that Jesus has been crucified, and they were followers of Jesus. And, uh, 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 and, uh, and then they've gotten a report that he's been raised from the dead, and they don't get this. So they're walking along, and they're talking. They're very animated in their discussion of this thing. And, and a stranger joins them on the, on the journey and begins walking and talking with them. And as, as this stranger walks and talks with them, um, their hearts begin to burn. They, they, they sense that there's something more to this person, and they recognize Jesus when... They prevail upon him to stay the night with them, and he breaks bread. He gave thanks, and they had seen that before, and their eyes were opened, and this is Jesus. And so to these troubled disciples, he said, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses... And all the prophets he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things written about himself. Now, and a little while later, he's going to say something similar, only this time there's a larger group of people gathered around who are now seeing the risen Christ for the very first time. And in this larger group, uh, skip down to verse 44, Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You see why I say that the most important truth that you will ever get has to do with who Jesus is and what he does. And, and interestingly, when Jesus describes what he calls the scriptures, the scriptures are described as the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. And interestingly, the Old Testament that we have today, what we call the Old Testament, has three divisions in it. Guess what they are? The law, the prophets, and part of the book is called the writings, which includes the book of Psalms. Psalms represents the writings. What Jesus was doing, and at the time that Jesus said these words, that was the Bible, that was the, the old, our Old Testament was the Bible that people recognized as being sacred scripture in Jesus' time. And what he said was all of the Old Testament, all that we've been reading, bears witness to me. It tells my story. And in the midst of reading the Old Testament, you get the message that the Son of God must suffer. He must die. And on the third day, he must be raised. And that you should go and tell the good news to other people. Proclaim repentance and forgiveness of sins in his name. Not some religious rite. Not some mysterious new truth. But that because Christ died for our sins. 
Because he was buried, because he was raised on the third day, because he is alive and well to this very moment, you can be forgiven all your sins. You can enter into a new relationship with God. It is not dependent upon anything that you do. It is the good news that God gives us. It is His promise. And you know, we may not have picked up on it very much as we read through the Old Testament. Some of us got lost in all those lists of names and the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of laws that didn't make any sense to us and so, all kinds of detailed things that, that just we wondered, what does this mean to me? But we have our Lord and Savior saying, this book tells my story. And we're right on the front end of learning how that story applies to our lives. And beginning after a couple of chapters in the Nehemiah that we've got to wind up before we've completely finished the Old Testament here, we're going to begin reading the story of Jesus and how God is on the march to redeem his entire creation and make it all new and include as many of you as will come in that kingdom. Amen? Amen. We're at a good place. So if you, if you fell behind in reading the Old Testament, just catch up with us and just pick up where we are. I think it's week 40. Is that where we are? Week 40, you'll start reading the New Testament and we'll continue God's story. And we'll see the great climax to what God is saying to us. Amen? Amen. Now, now, in the context of our worship time today, God's word is never proclaimed, but that we are confronted with our need to respond, our responsibility to answer back as God speaks to our hearts. For some of us in this place today, your answer back to God is to say, I trust in Christ alone for the gift of eternal life. And if that has never happened in your life before, I urge you, I beg you, please, simply bow before Jesus and say, forgive me my sins and come into my life and save me forever. And he promises to do that. And today, right here, right now, can be the place of your new beginning. There's a second response, or second group of people that need to respond here, and it's, it's you Christians. Uh, you Christians who continue to, to have this sin principle working in your life that misleads you and takes you astray and, and makes you depart from God. That you, you think you can whoop it on your own, but you can't. You never will be able to whoop it on your own. You have an old sin nature. It's called the flesh. And, and it, it will, it will, it's a boat anchor on your spiritual life. will be to the day you die. But God gives you power to overcome it. And he gives you the opportunity to rededicate yourself to him. And some of you Christians, many of you Christians, perhaps all of us Christians in this place need to be willing to rededicate ourselves to following Jesus, to receiving the gr grace that he gives us. There's another group of people in this place that perhaps need to respond in the third way. You're a Christian. You want your life to count for God. You're seeking his direction for the living of your life day by day, and you've been worshiping with this congregation, but you've never yet made a commitment to become a part of this, this body. Would you do that today? Would you decide this is your place that God has brought you, and this is where he wants you to serve? Come and unite with us.